Welcome back everybody to Fight and Revive with Adam Boyers. You can see today we've got a new audio setup. The lapel mic served me well while it lasted, but it's uh, going to be moved to a reserve mic now. So uh, we bid a fond farewell to it as we moved on to a new setup now. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about one of the biggest congressional races this year in Texas and maybe in the whole country. Gun YouTuber Brandon Herrera is trying to primary and take on one of the most well-established members of Congress, Tony Gonzalez. We're going to break it down, talk about who I think is the better candidate, and what's going to happen, who will win today on Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. America is no longer one nation under God. Are you ready to fight for a revival? Well, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. The goal with this episode is to expose some of Gonzalez's, Tony Gonzalez's, the incumbent's outright Democrat positions he has, and showing you why he needs to be replaced in Texas's 23rd district. Brandon Herrera's story, his challenger, is one of an underdog who has taken the fight to one of the most well-funded and entrenched establishment incumbents in all of Congress. Will he succeed? Today we're going to see why he must, if... Uh, the conservatives are going to make any progress in the Congress this year. Uh, so, right at the intro, as we go here, start to get going, we're going to watch this video from a recent interview Tony Gonzalez gave on CNN, which will launch us perfectly into the episode. So let's go ahead and watch that. But I served with some real scumbags. Look, uh, uh, Matt Gates, uh, he paid uh, minors to have sex with them at drug parties. Bob Good endorsed my opponent, a known neo-Nazi. These people used to walk around with white hoods at night. Now they're walking around with white hoods in the daytime. I, look, I, what didn't surprise me that some of these folks voted against aid to Israel, but I was encouraged to see by a nearly 10 to one mark that Republicans supported our allies on the battlefield. Wow, okay. I should <laughs> say that uh, the federal government did look into Matt Gates and those allegations and they decided not to prosecute. I have never heard, I mean, I've heard you say a lot of things. What you just said at the top of this discussion was um, intense. <laughs> and d is it your sense that, well, I'm just asking from your own opinion uh, and own perspective, you're, you're trying to put them in a box and put them in a corner. Members, members are tired, we're exhausted. It has been a brutal Congress. By the way, don't forget to check out fightandrevive.com and read my most recent article detailing why I am supporting Congressman Bob Good for re-election and not his opponent, John McGuire. Okay, so we're going to uh, start with a little bit on that video from Tony Gonzalez. So I found it very interesting that he called the conservative members of Congress scumbags. Uh, by that, I think he means mostly the Freedom Caucus, so you have Bob Good. Um, you have Matt Gates, you have Chip Roy, um, I'm trying to think of other members, Andrew Clyde, I suppose, um, maybe Byron Donald, and he's referring to all these guys as scumbags because presumably they're, you know, just because they're not supporting him. Uh, so something tells me that if they were to support him for re-election, suddenly they wouldn't be scumbags anymore, but maybe that's just me, you know, maybe that's a little conspiracy theory of mine. Um, he repeated the claim that I mean, it's it's like the go-to Democrat claim that Matt Gates is a sex trafficker. Oh, heavens to Betsy. Um, for reference, federal prosecutors dropped all charges versus Gates for sex trafficking and obstruction of justice last year. Um, so even though this claim still gets repeated constantly by establishment scumbags, dare I say, and Democrats all the time, um, it's amazing how often the rhinos and the Democrats share each other's rhetoric. And here we go. Um, as I've said before on the show, I don't use the term rhino lightly. Republican in name only means they they would fit better in the Democrat Party, and I don't use that term lightly. I think this describes a lot of the members of the Republican Party right now, though. Um, he said, quote, Bob Good endorsed my opponent, a known neo-Nazi. These people used to walk around with white hoods at night. Now they walk around with white hoods in the daytime. Ooh, scary, scary, scary. I find, again, it goes exactly to what I, with what I was saying. Um... The fact that he's saying like the exact sense of, oh, Republicans are neo-Nazis, Republicans are racist. Like, dude, you're literally, you're literally just taking a page out of the Democrats' playbook, except you're uh, calling the extreme, and I use that with air quotes. Um, you're saying the extreme members of your party are, you know, these big, bad, scary Klansmen, I guess. Like, really? That's 
does he think the people, I mean, granted, he did the interview on CNN, so maybe their audience is this dumb, I don't know, but maybe he thinks they're going to assume that, oh yeah, Republicans are actually out there, you know, marching with white hoods, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's what he's gunning for, but not a compelling argument, in my opinion. Uh, I want to say real quick before we continue, his little comment about, we're exhausted, it has been a brutal Congress, that was the quote. <laughs> like, it's a hard knock life, bud. There are a rare couple of members of Congress, I will admit, that do work hard, mostly conservatives, and there are probably some Democrats as well, and are constantly bashed for working hard and actually getting stuff done, and I can imagine that is mentally and emotionally taxing, but for the rhinos and do-nothings like Gonzalez, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy. Uh, you know, poor dude gets paid $174,000 a year and finally has to do something more than fly back and forth from D.C. and vote against you know, or for the Democrats' agenda, really, and he's exhausted. Yeah, um, cut me a break. So, I'm going to, first of all, I just want to mention, well, no, I'll use that as a, uh, here, I'll use that to wrap it up. I'm going to go to those websites. There's a website up, put up by, is it a PAC? It's not the Herrera campaign, but it's one of those, you know, organizations that are not technically affiliated with the campaign, but they're to take down the opponent, basically. Okay, it is paid for Brandon Herrera by Congress, by Brandon Herrera for Congress. The website is TonyBetrayedUs.com. And before you think, oh boy, Adam's just being all biased. He's going to a hit piece website. All these are very thoroughly sourced and documented. And so I'm going to talk about these because they're facts and I'm going to talk about them. And if they end up being wrong, you can call me out in the comment section, but the sources seem to be very accurate. Uh, Tony Gonzalez, it says, has betrayed his conservative constituents by voting for Biden's gun control, fighting Biden's gun control, fighting against border security measures, and voting for taxpayer-funded drag shows at the Pentagon. He voted for the January 6th Commission. He joined every Democrat and voted for the J6 Commission to investigate and imprison President Trump. Uh, 117th Congress, House Resolution 3233. Uh, they have a vote citation there from House.gov. Uh, they have a bill explanation from Texas Tribune. Um, he opposed and fought border security. Uh, he opposed the border secure the border safety and security act that was this Congress, the 118th. He called this border to secure. He called this bill to secure the border quote un-American. Um, let me see here. Yes, bill explanation is Texas GOP votes to censor Representative Tony Gonzalez over votes on same-sex marriage, guns, and border security, and that's true. They did. Um, the Texas GOP did vote to censor him. Um, was 57 to 5 is what I'm seeing from the Fox News article with one abstention. And from that article, we have the 64-member state Republican Executive Committee voted in favor of the resolution 57 to 5 at its quarterly meeting in Austin. They censured Tony Gonzalez. They accused Gonzalez of engaging in, quote, a pattern of action demonstrably opposed to the state's principles and legislative priorities. It cites his votes, sorry, video play. It cited his votes in favor of the Respect for Marriage Act, which established federal protections for same sex and interracial marriage, and was signed by President Biden in December, as violating principles preserving self sufficient families found on the traditional marriage of a natural man and natural woman. So, from what I know of that bill, it was basically trying to codify um, gay marriage um, into law, and they call it the Respect for Marriage Act, naturally, when it's literally the exact opposite. Uh, the resolution also separately took aim at Gonzalez, who represents the border district, for having failed to support a key Republican border security bill in the House that would block migrants from entering the U.S. Uh, so the, uh, it goes on. The resolution also calls out Gonzalez for voting against a House GOP rules package and voting and for voting in favor of the bipartisan Safe for Communities Act, a bipartisan gun control law. I love bipartisan. A uh, written in response to the mass shootings in Uvalde, so and New York. I just want to point out, we'll leave this article now, but the term bipartisan is thrown around as a you can't you must support this. You can't oppose this now. That's how you're supposed to you're supposed to you're supposed to hear bipartisan and think, oh okay, then it must be perfect. There must be nothing wrong with it if both parties support it. Nothing can be further from the truth. And if someone attacks you as being partisan, that may just mean you don't want a bunch of compromised legislation. I'll leave it at that. Um Let's see here. There's more. Um, one of the big ones for me anyway, because I'm still not over this. He voted to fund a federal vaccine tracking database. Gonzalez voted to spend $400, $400 million for vaccine databases that would enable the federal government to violate Americans' privacy by tracking their vaccination status. Again, bill explanation from CPAC ratings, conservative.org, vote citation from house.gov. 
voted for Biden's gun control agenda. Tony voted for the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which expands federal background checks, includes red flag laws, and threatens the Second Amendment rights of adults under 21 years. And then, again, vote citation, Office of the Clerk, U.S. House of Representatives, Bill Explanation, Heritage Action for America. And there's more. Voted for taxpayer funding of drag shows on military bases. And uh, vote to send the $40 billion to defend Ukraine border, Ukraine's border. That's par for the course in the modern establishment Republican Party now. Voted for taxpayer funding of abortions. He voted to allow federal funding for abortion. I didn't even realize that. I hadn't even seen that till now. Again, vote citation, office of the clerk. If you want to go check these, double check these and make sure I'm not getting anything wrong. I don't think I am, but if you want to check for yourself, TonyBetrayedUs.com. T-O-N-Y, betrayedus, all one word, dot com. Okay, now on the flip side of this, let me make sure I'm not getting off course here. Let's uh, follow that up with a little bit about Brandon Herrera. So his website is very simple, but very straightforward. I appreciate that. Um, issues, solving the border crisis. Brandon will block any spending bills that do not include finishing the wall, returning to the Remain in Mexico policy, and ending the phony asylum claim racket. Cutting taxes, spending, and regulation. Improve veterans' health care. Defending gun rights. And this is his big thing, obviously. His really big thing is defending gun rights. I think Gonzalez voted for a gun control measure, and when he did, that was what pushed Herrera over the edge to decide to run for it. Um, and obviously, he has his big YouTube channel, about 3.5 million subscribers, where he tries out all sorts of really cool guns. And so... He's an expert on this, and he's really big on it. Uh, he'll fight for national concealed carry legislation and block any effort to pass red flag laws or any new firearms restrictions. Any at all. That's impressive. He will also increase funding for firearm training for school employees to better protect our children. Love that one. Increasing fu funding for firearm training for school employees. That's incredible. Schools are one of those dangerous places to be because they're gun-free zones. That's why so many mass shootings happen in schools. It's one of the reasons. He wants to enact term limits protecting homeschooling and school choice, oppose endless wars, and then uh, funding Social Security and Medicare. It says he'll oppose cutting those. Um, Brandon has signed the U.S. Term Limits Pledge and will co-sponsor co a constitutional amendment limiting members of Congress to three terms and U.S. Senators to two terms to restore the citizen legislature our founders envisioned. Love that, too. So that's, that's where Herrera stands on a bunch of issues. I'm trying to keep this episode shorter, so I'm not going to go through um, <clears throat> all of these at length, but if you want to find out more about him, Brandon Herrera for Congress.com. Very easy to remember. Brandon H E R R E R A for Congress.com slash issues. Okie doke. Moving on. So, first of all, before we continue, don't forget to subscribe to Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer on YouTube. Our subscriber and view count has skyrocketed over the past few months. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you so much. There is a lot more to see on the channel. You can go check out my interview with Delegate Eric Zare, which I'm hoping uh, gets some attention. Delegate Zare is not a national figure, obviously. He's just here in Virginia, a local politician, a local delegate, but he's a godly man, a very conservative man. I'm very grateful to have him in the House of Delegates. To find out more about him, go watch that interview on him in two parts up on the channel. Okie doke. So how is the current state of the race as we wrap up here? What's going on? So... The Texas' 23rd Congressional District, as I understand it, it runs from the western side of San Antonio up to El Paso. Um, again, as I understand it, the majority of it is rural, which is usually a good sign for conservatives. So that's the way the district's laid out. Now, on March 5th, there was a runoff, uh, or there was a primary election. March 5th was the primary election. That's when uh, Texas voted for their president, and this is when they voted originally for the primary. And Gonzalez won with 45%. Herrera had 24.2%. So you might think, you know, off the top of your head, that sounds like, oh, that's not good. He lost the primary. But the way Texas is in the primary, and I'm assuming in the general elections as well, if you don't attain 50% plus one of the votes, then that candidate and the number two candidate for the same seat head to a runoff election. A lot of states are like this. So Gonzalez got 45.4% or 24,584 votes. I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you, so try to follow me here. Herrera got 24.2% or 13,123 votes. There were also three other candidates running who, com who combined garnered 30.3% of the vote or 16,453 votes. So again, at first glance, those numbers look pretty good for Gonzalez, but... 
he did not attain that 50%. He needed to avoid a runoff, which means he got first, Herrera got second, and now it's on to, an, now from the primary, it's on to a runoff election happening. What is the date here? Is it May 23rd, I want to say? I think I have my notes somewhere. I don't see it at the moment. I believe it's May 23rd is the runoff election. May 28th, there it is. May 28th is the runoff election. So now, um, barring an almost statistically impossible tie, of course, one of the candidates will receive at least 50% plus one of three votes and will be the Republican nominee. So now you can see from those numbers, Herrera only received a little over 53% of the votes that Gonzalez did. So, you know, Gonzalez, al or Gonzalez almost doubled up the votes that Herrera got. That's not great. That's true, but here is why this race is far from over. Other candidates garnered 16,453 votes. There were five candidates running, including Gonzalez. Now, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to give an example here. For the sake of simplicity, we will assume that the total vote count, here's where I'm throwing these numbers at you, for the runoff is the exact same as the primary. That's highly unlikely, as runoffs generally garner less votes than primaries. And even if this were an exception to the rule, under normal circumstances, the original primary was also the date for the presidential primary, meaning vote turnout would be higher than otherwise. So the runoff election is almost guaranteed to have a lower vote turnout. But let's just assume it's the same here. Herrera needs 13,958 votes to go to him of those that went to other candidates in the primary. Which, again, assuming the candidates' totals are the exact same as the war in the runoff, would mean Herrera would defeat Gonzalez with a tally of 27,081 votes to 27,080. Or, in other words, one vote. Now, obviously, these vote totals are not going to stay the exact same, but I give you these numbers to help put into perspective how Herrera needs to do. It's very likely that in the runoff, he needs to take at least 75 to 80 percent of the votes from the other candidates who finished below him and Gonzalez in the primary. As those 13,000, excuse me, 13,958 votes are about 84% of that other candidate total from the primary. Tracking? No? Well, then rewind the video and listen to it again, because I'm not explaining all that again. <laughs> uh, that's the best I can explain it. Um, now, obviously, that's a big task to get 84% of the, of the other candidate vote, but is it possible? I think it might be. Consider this. The vast majority of the people that voted for Herrera or the other candidates in the original primary voted for those people because they do not like Gonzalez, presumably. Take this as an example. Julie Clark, who finished third place in the primary behind Gonzalez and Herrera with 14%, posted this on social media after the third place finish. Speaking of Gonzalez, she posted, Guess what? Lots of question marks. I'm still in this race to make sure you lose, all caps. In other words, as that so eloquently demonstrates, where are most of these votes going to go in the runoff? Obviously, the answer is the majority will very likely go to Herrera. Will enough go to him to give him the victory? That is the question that remains to be seen. It's very likely that you will have to split off some Gonzalez voters to win. And I also think that's possible. Now that he's getting all this media attention from forcing the runoff, his name is going to get out there more and more. He's going to be able to continue to spend money and raise money, and his team will be able to work to make sure with this extra time that people know his name. And they'll know why he, they'll try to get out the message why he is the better choice over Gonzalez. As I mentioned earlier, this district is largely rural and that usually strongly favors conservatives. If he can get his message out and make sure people know about him and know about Gonzalez's record, I definitely think this is possible. With that said, Gonzalez is going to be putting a lot of time in this. He's going to have a lot of big dogs campaigning for him, as, such as Governor Greg Abbott, not a rhino, but an establishment figure. Mike Johnson, establishment increasingly looking like a rhino. He's going to be spending millions to keep his seat. Um, he's very well established, very well entrenched. He's got a lot of money to spend. He's already spent a lot of it. The grassroots, as we like to call them, the dedicated, the local Republican committees, the local dedicated people that are putting up signs, knocking doors, they're going to be incredibly strong on this one, both with their time and their financial resources. I personally have donated to Brandon Herrera's campaign, and I hope you will consider doing it as well. As in addition to supporting him, if you check out his YouTube channel, you'll find out there's a he has some pretty cool fundraisers going on as well. Uh, I will just say, if you're a gun fan, you want to check out his YouTube channel. I think it's just Brandon Herrera, unless I'm forgetting something. It's Brandon Herrera. He's got some pretty cool fundraisers going on. Now, it does seem that his campaign is gaining momentum. We'll have to watch and see. Um, like I said, 
I do recommend donating to him to oust one of the worst members of Congress. Even rhinos are often worse than Dems, in my opinion. I say worst members of Congress, not just worst Republicans. Often, like I said, the rhinos, I think, are worse than the Democrats because they're even more blatantly traitors. For example, I, I skipped past this earlier a little bit, but Heritage Action, which delivers conservative scores to every member of Congress to see how they vote, they gave him a 66% score for this session and 74% for life. The average House Republican has 70 is a 71% score from Heritage Action. So, in other words, he's barely above average lifetime, below average during this session, and you heard those votes like I told you earlier. Those are really bad votes, so even that might be a little bit generous. So, let's see if Herrera pulls out. I'm excited. Keep an eye on him. Go support him on social media. Check out his campaign. If you're in his district, vote for Brandon Herrera for Congress. In the words of our great president, look here, Jack. I'll challenge you to push-ups, but that's neither here nor there. Don't forget to subscribe to the Fight and Revive YouTube channel and help us reach more people with our conservative message.